Good morning, everybody. Hey, I hope you're all up and ready for this thing. Uh, welcome to The Cutting Room in New York City. I'm Brad Talinsky with Backstory Events. And today's show is going to be live streamed on guitarworld.com. So uh, behave yourself. Uh, upcoming Backstory Events include uh, an evening with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. That's coming up next week. Uh, tickets available still. And uh, we're doing something really cool with um, the guys in Mo and Blues Traveler together. And they're actually going to perform together. That's uh, next month. Check it out on backstoryevents.com uh, for that and all upcoming events. Uh, but here on our stage tonight, we have with us one of the certainly most innovative and imaginative guitarists of the last couple decades. You know him from bands like Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave and his solo project, The Night Watchman. But he's here to discuss with us this really um, super interesting uh, solo album, The Atlas Underground. So let's bring him out, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Morello. Hello, everyone. How are you this morning? Good rock morning to you. Well, I thought we'd start out by talking about uh, the thing that everybody's talking about, the most important thing, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you have this uh, video that's sort of burning up the internet now uh, where you're playing the Game of Thrones theme song with uh, Nuno Betancourt, Scott Ian from Anthrax, and I think even the creators of the show, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did that come about? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Ramin, who uh, scores the show, has been a friend for some time. And, uh, and Dan Weiss, who is one of the creators of the show, is an aspiring metal shredder, an accomplished metal shredder, and also a, a, a dad at my kid's school. So we, uh, <laughs> we, we sort of bonded over metal. And then when the idea came up to do a, a version of the Game of Thrones theme with these Fender guitars that were custom made for the event, I was happy to do it. And we had a fun time rocking that. That's, that's cool. So uh, are you a fan of the show? I am. I'm uh, 74 and a half hours in, like everybody else right now. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite character? Uh, I'm kind of partial to the wolves and dragons. <laughs> uh, they're the only ones you can really trust in the whole thing. <laughs> so who's going to end up on the throne? Uh, that I don't know. That oh, I don't come know. on. I, don't, I, don't, I wish I did. Um, if I did, I'd go to know. Vegas and I'd put it all down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm picking Tyrion. I know he has no chance, but, you know, dissolute. Yeah, yeah my wife's on board with him as well. And, you know, it's all good. It's <laughs> all good. So, uh, the Atlas Underground. I, I thought it's really one of the bravest and most interesting guitar records, certainly, of, of this year. Um, for those that haven't had a chance to, to listen to it or dig into it, especially those out in Guitar World land, uh, you guys should. But uh, can you give me the overall concept for the record? Sure, sure. The idea for the Atlas Underground record, uh, it's a sonic conspiracy. In a way, I wanted to find a way to inflict my guitar, my guitar vision on a new generation by making kind of a Trojan horse record for electric guitar, you know? Um, so I wanted to make a record that was unapologetically um, uh, analog, Marshall stack driven, but that is... Uh, has one foot in the world of 2019 Sonics. And so collaborating with people like Bass Nectar and Knife Party um, and Pretty Lights and the Wu-Tang Clan and Gary Clark Jr. and Marcus Mumford and, uh, you know... Uh, uh, Portugal the Man. And Portugal the Man and uh, a number of other artists. There's 20 collaborators on the record. I wanted to make a... Like when... Music, it's good. It's good for two reasons, in my opinion. It, if it's a band, it's chemistry that makes it, makes it good, where you create something together that none of you could create alone. When it's a solo artist, it's good because of a purity of vision. And I wanted to make a record that had the best of both worlds. I wanted a record that was curated by me, that had an overarching concept and driven by um, my guitar playing, but at the same time, on in the individual tracks, be able to have collaborative partners who would help me find interesting musical and artistic surprises. So... so uh, I read this one interview with you, and you said that you did have these three very distinct goals for the record. And, and one of them was to play 
guitar outside of the norm yeah. or play music outside of the norm. I mean, how did you think you accomplished that? On sure, this definitely. I mean, I've made, this is my 19th studio record, right? And 18 of those records have been played with a band standing in a room you know, toe to toe and looking each other in the eye. And I've made those records before. I was like, how can I make an exciting guitar record? But in, in the idea was, you know, it was, we have lofty ambitions for this record. It was to forge a new genre of music, something that has the, like the, the bones of, um, of, of EDM and bass drops, but the meat of rock and roll guitar. And uh, that synthesis, in, in my mind, hasn't been attempted on an album scale, hasn't been done successfully, and that's what we really aim for for this record. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, do you think guitar players have gotten lazy? I mean, do, I, in, this, in the sense that, I mean, I, I sort of feel this is that it's been very easy for uh, guitar players to sort of fall back and, uh, on, on sort of nostalgic sure. yeah. uh, music. And not, you know, it used to be that the guitars used to drive modern music, yes. and now it's sort of taken a back seat. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's because guitar players got lazy. There, there tends to be, like when you pick up guitar, the reason you pick it up is because you love other guitar players, right? And yeah. you consider good guitar playing to sound like the guitar players that you like and love. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's an inherent conservatism in that. Uh, and I found, when I, I just didn't start playing until I was 17 years old, so I started playing rather late, and I tried to, uh, play like my fit, whether it was Randy Rhodes or Steve Vai, players like that. And I found there was a, an epiphany. It was a moment in the early 90s, in the very beginning days of Rage Against the Machine, we were opening up for two cover bands at a college somewhere in the San Fernando Valley. And each of the cover bands uh, that we were opening up for had a shredding guitar, like a really t talented technician in the band. And I thought, if we're really in this crappy gig, like on a Wednesday night in the Valley, and there's two guitar players with this incredible te technique in a me meaningless, I thought there doesn't need to be three. And I really began <laughs> practicing my eccentricities in my playing and trying to find my own lane and my own voice, which opened up a world of sonic possibilities. So. I mean, I think that's a real important lesson for any musician, yeah. let alone guitar players, is the hard part is finding your own voice. That's right. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a, there's a distinction between musicians and artists, and both are, both are great, and both can make great music. But to, there are plenty of artists on the guitar who have limited technical capabilities, but make, you know, if you look from the Ramones to the Clash to the Sex Pistols to whoever, even the Edge in some ways, you know, is not someone who's like a technically vir a virtuoso on the instrument, but has created an entire sonic world of you know, wonderful songs you know, based, on, based on his playing. And so I think that that's really like the challenge is, it's fine if your aspirations are to sound exactly like your guitar heroes, that's something you can do. If your aspirations are to have a thing in common with your guitar heroes, that is finding your own unique voice, that's something that's possible as well, but maybe takes a little bit more inspiration. I mean, you've also mentioned uh, sort of the evoke the spirit of Jimi Hendrix when you were talking about yeah. this record. Yeah. And I'm assuming you mean that a little more philosophically yes, yes, than, yeah, 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 yeah. than literally. Yeah, I, de I definitely wanted to make a record that was the Hendrix of now, but I don't mean that in the sense of a blues rock album with wah-wah pedal you know, shredding at the forefront. Um, the idea is to make a record that does have very forward and progressive and to the best of my ability, is extraordinary guitar playing. Second, one of the things that, Jimi Hendrix was a very flamboyant character, played great guitar, but he had songs on the radio. He inflicted his guitar vision on the world because of great songs that were on the radio. And three, um, Jimi Hendrix, the milieu in which he worked was blues rock. Uh, that, was the, that was the musical ethos of his time. Yeah. The musical ethos of our time is different from that. And so the idea was to sort of be the Hendrix of, make a record that's the Hendrix of now by checking those three boxes. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the other goals that you mentioned, was to create music for the radio. And uh, on the surface, it would seem like... Guitar a little, music for the radio. Guitar music, guitar music for the radio. For the radio. Yeah. Um, in a certain way, it seems like almost a little bit at odds that you want to do something innovative, yet you want to do yeah. music for the radio. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's, I, I, I know a lot of young people who have never been to a concert where there's been a live guitar player. You know, it's not on their radar. It's not on their radar. And the, the, you listen to the, the, whether it's either the alternative rock station or the pop rock station, there's almost zero guitars on it and there's no guitar solos on it, period. Um, the song, every step that I take, the song that I did with Portugal the Man and Weathen on this record was a song that was a, an alternative rock 
song that was on the radio for the first time in maybe a decade, a song that got as high as that Dead on Charts, had a screaming guitar solo in it. So, and to some extent, mission accomplished. So, yeah, let's yeah. hear it. Ooh. Let's hear it for guitar solos, people. This may be a somewhat prejudiced audience in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> no one's arguing against guitar solos on the radio in this room right now. But I mean, guitar solos used to be a staple of the radio, and it's one of the reasons that, that fired people up. And I've played, you know, one in this on this Atlas Underground tour that we're doing. We play in a wide variety of. Uh, venues, including I played the Ultra Festival, which is the biggest EDM festival on the planet, where the average audience member's age is probably 18 or 19. They've never seen an electric guitar player before. So by taking some of these big, big bass drops and things, I'll tell you this, one of the interesting things that guitar players may not know is that a lot of the people who are at the cutting edge, the, the heavier edge of EDM, like Bass Nectar, like Skrillex, like Knife Party, huge Rage Against the Machine fans. The idea of the drop in EDM music comes perhaps from the arrangement sensibilities of Rage Against the Machine, where the, t the, the, the bowstring pulled taut tension that releases in a bullet in the head or a fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, is now, you know, happens 18 times in each EDM song. But the, so my concept with this record was, let's take those sensibilities that perhaps germinated in the world of rock and roll, have become popular in the world of EDM, replace your synthesizers with my Marshall stack and have like this, this kind of a cyborg hybrid. But, you know, I mean, to that point, um, so the, the, the fact that the guitars dropped off a little bit has something to do with guitar players, too. They have to, you know, learn a, a, a different set of skills. That's correct. In That's order correct. To, uh, to sort of intermingle with these guys. I mean, uh, was that uh, tricky for you on this record to somehow make the guitar fit in with this music? Yeah, no, no I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a thrilling exploration as an artist to get outside of my safety zone, you know, and some of the, I'll give you two examples. One, the song called Rabbit's Revenge that I did with Bass Nectar and Killer Mike and Big Boy. Um, I sent Lauren, that's Bass Nectar's real name, uh, reveal. <laughs> uh, I sent him a bunch of like kick-ass riffs and crazy guitar sounds and, and he listened to me and said, not feeling any of those. I'm like, okay, well, how shall we proceed then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, with sort of the, the sort of the open-minded idea that the only thing that matters on this record is at the end of the day the collaborators love the result. So you're not feeling those. Figure it out. So he came down to my house and I was warming up and he said, "That's it." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "What you just played." I'm, like, I'm just warming. We said, "Those four bars right there is gonna that's gonna be the jam." I'm like. Really? Did, and I look over my engineer, I'm like, did we record that? And he's like, luckily we did, sir. <laughs> uh, and it became really the foundation for him. So it was great to sort of get out of my safety zone and to hear, he's a huge Rage fan, he was like, this is going to be a huge drop. An, a a, a counterexample was a song with Knife Party, where I did send them like a box of riffs. Like, here's some grade A plutonium riffs. And what they did was they took those analog ideas and cut them up in the way that they make their songs, replacing their digital sensibilities to make a song called Battle Sirens, which is the, uh, ended up being the first song on the record. Well, the thing is, is you've uh, sort of exploring all these different genres, and I love the record, and, and, and I sort of got it right away. But did you ever, in the back of your mind, fear that, okay, um, I'm doing, you know, working in hip hop, I'm working EDM, I'm working with rock, that maybe this, you'll be like a centrist Democrat. It won't really appeal, <laughs> it won't appeal to anybody. <laughs> I mean, I've, to, I've, let me tell you, the one thing I, one thing I am so, of, of the, the North Star of my career, like, I don't give a shit. You know, like, I make music that I love, that's the, yeah. since the, I was in a band called Lockup before Rage Against the Machine, and we got a record deal, and we thought, we're gonna be famous, and so we're gonna listen to what everybody says, and we're gonna try to do the thing, and that band got dropped, and I vowed to myself, the day that we got dropped from our record deal, I was now, I know, I had my chance at the, my grab at the brass ring, I failed at it. I said, well, I'm never going to play another note of music that I don't believe in. You know, and my entire, from making Rage and Audio Slave records that sold millions to making Night Watchman records, acoustic records that sold thousands. Like, I've, I've been on a journey to just make music that is fulfilling to me, and whichever part of my audience wants to come along, fantastic. If new people want to join, if you don't like it, there's plenty of room to not listen. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. Totally cool. Totally cool. Well, you, you, you said that you chose a wide range of artists for this record, sort of based on the fact that they had some like-mindedness. Yeah. 
And uh, I was sort of wondering what you meant by that. Like, yeah. what was the like mind? Well, I'm going to proselytize a little bit more on the on the, on yeah, the pre yeah, yeah. previous question. Is like, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is this kind of you play to your audience's expectations in a way that boxes you in and can really stunt your creativity. You're trying to like outguess, you know, what your fans think. And if you, I, I have a great deal of respect for my fans, and I think it's it, it's mutual in ways. Like. Th this is the journey that I'm on, and it might be where I'm making four Americana records in a row. And if you're on that journey, fantastic. If you want to take those off, bless your heart. You know. Uh, <laughs> but the one thing with this, re this record and this tour, it has been an uh, unapologetic return to playing a lot of electric guitar. The shows, these shows are the most guitar solo oriented shows that I've ever played in my entire life. Anyway, you were asking a new question that I was still wound up on the last one. <laughs> I was just wondering what, what we have in common what, what, in what the you, sonic conspiracy, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> what what you felt was the the thread or the, the thread. connection? Yeah, 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 sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Together. It's it's artists of different genres who have sort of a the the, the idea was people who were going to be adventurous musically and were going to have uh, uh, the, the 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 lyrical theme that runs through the record is social justice ghost stories and the idea is we wanted to tell stories of like martyrs of the past to inform struggles of the present and hopefully light a sonic beacon towards a more just and humane future. That was sort of the broad scope. I mean, what was your process in the lyric writing yeah. Uh, thing? Yeah, I mean, the lyric writing was, uh, s some of the lyrics I helped and write, some I did write, but for, I wanted the, each of the artists to be able to, the singers or rappers to be able to really own the song. So I'd get on the phone, I'd explain sort of the general concept and say, how do you feel this fits? And whether it was Big Boy and Killer Mike, who wrote about police brutality, to uh, Marcus Mumford, who uh, the song sort of t touches on, like the, it's, it's a whispered conversation through a, a death row prison wall. Mm -hmm. um, each of the artists could sort of take that in their own thread with a more a vague poetic license or a more uh, topical point of view. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I do notice that, that uh, police brutality is um, sort of a big theme on this record. Uh, and it's you, a big theme in our country. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the ACLU just uh, um, announced you that you're the official ambassador, I want to get this right, of the campaign for smart justice. Yeah. Um, Can you go into a little detail for those that, sure, that don't know sure, about sure. what yeah, the ACLU yeah. does? First of all, I have, a, I have a long history with the ACLU. The ACLU is the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, and their job is basically to stand up for freedom and justice in a nonpartisan way. My first encounter with them uh, was, was with my high school underground newspaper in Libertyville, Illinois. A number of us worked on the official school paper, and uh, we wanted to write articles about apartheid South Africa, death squads in Central America, and the fact that the dean of students was a dick. And uh, the, uh, the school did, didn't like the sound of any of that, so we formed an underground paper called the Student Pulse, a competitive paper that we would pass out in the hallway. They, we had very uh, sort of off-color cartoons and wrote about political subjects and subjects in the school, which the school didn't like. So they said, you cannot pass it out in school. And we had the sneaking suspicion that the First Amendment applied to 17-year-olds as well. Uh, uh, so we called up the Chicago ACLU and asked them, and they said, it sure does. So they sent an attorney to uh, Libertyville High School to have a talk with the administration, and we taught the uh, LHS public school a lesson in physics that they will not soon forget. Uh, and that was my first encounter with the ACLU. Um, so I've been a proponent of their, of their uh, uh, unflagging um, fight for freedom of speech and freedoms. Uh, and so this campaign for smart justice, where I'm the first musician to become an ambassador of this, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to do my ambassadorial duties well. But in each of the cities we travel to on this tour, and more broadly, issues of mass incarceration, um, racial and economic injustice in the justice system, uh, we try to find a way to be a megaphone in each of these cities with my audience, with a broader audience, to inform people what's going on and how they can get involved to help make change for a more just and decent country. Yeah. With electric guitars. Is there some place that people can reach out specifically to if they want to get involved? Yeah, I mean, if you if you just Google ACLU Smart Justice Campaign and there and New York City, there'll be uh, opportunity to see what's going on here where you can be involved. Um, getting back to uh, Atlas Underground, mm -hmm. 
you collaborated with so many incredible artists of so many different genres, DJs, hip hop, uh, rappers, uh, rock guys. How did you do that logistically? <laughs> well, the record was made over the course of some time. You know, intermittently I would be touring with Prophets of Rage or touring with Bruce Springsteen, uh, and then I would return to my um, home studio. And it was just a matter of, you know, sort of one schedule's aligning, and like one day, like Wu Tang Clan comes over, or Marcus Mumford and I Skype, you know, after dropping our kids off at school. There was some good dad rock involved in it as well. <laughs> it's a whole different scene, like when you've got little kids. Like it used to be, the jam will begin at 2 a.m. Now it's like, like the jam will begin with a cup of coffee in our robes, you know, after <laughs> drop off at 9.45 a.m. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, so, and so each of the songs happened in a very different way. Sometimes it was rock via email, where as we're traveling the planet, I would take a time at Soundcheck to record some riffs and send it off to Knife Party or Pretty Lights or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but my fa one of my favorite experiences was the jam with Gary Clark Jr. So Gary, who I'm a big fan of and run into a couple times at award shows, and someone who your audience is probably familiar with as well, um, he came over to my studio and we just jammed for three hours with no preconceived idea of what we were going to play. We just got a rhythm section and just played and um, threw lyrics back and forth. And so then we had this kind of expansive three-hour you know, chunk of music, which then I cut into two songs. One is Where It's At Ain't What It Is, which is on the record, and the other one is Can't Stop the Bleeding, which is a single which we released more recently. And I'm a huge fan of Gary as a, as a vocalist and as a guitar player, so it was such an honor and a pleasure to rock with that guy and come up with two jams that I'm really proud of. You know, I'm a huge fan of, of Gary's too. And I have to say, um, if you guys are out there, if you haven't checked it out, I think these are two of Gary's best vocals. I mean, yeah, you got I'm him to really yeah, loosen yeah. up on this. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So again, yeah. the songs are called Can't Stop the Bleeding and uh, Where It's At yeah. Ain't What It Is. Yeah. You were saying like you wanted to bring back guitars through martial amps, mm -hmm. that kind of vibe. But, um, you know, different guitar players I've talked to seem to have a problem whenever they record, I'm gonna get it, go into some nerd talk here, guitar nerd talk. Um, when they... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the back's like, at last! Enough of this ambassador bullshit. Let's get... What about what humbuckers does he use? <laughs> um, you know, I found when they go into, like, the digital world, like yeah. you went into, that it's better to record those guitar parts direct. Mm. Well, I never, I, I personally never went into the digital world. My guitar, I've used the same setup since 1988. You know, like I'm a, uh, very much a creature of uh, uh, like embracing limitations in that regard. I had, I think we've probably talked about this before in your publication, but but I, uh, for as a young man, I quested for the perfect sound um, with the wrong guitar and the wrong amp. And then one day in late 1988, frustrated, I spent a couple of hours at rehearsal and I dialed my amp to the best I could make it and my guitar to the best I could make it. And I marked those settings and they haven't changed since. That <laughs> amp and that guitar will be played at the show tonight here with those same settings and that same guitar <laughs> that I decided to settle for. And rather than worrying about chasing some imagined tone, I said, this is my tone, and now I'm gonna create with that and let the chips fall where they may. Well, how did you uh, go about, like you're saying, you recorded some riffs. I yep. mean, what I thought was fascinating about the record was when I was listening to it, I was really having to listen closely. And the lines blur yeah. often, yeah. you yeah. know, on the record. Uh, between, is that a That's right. synth sound? That's right, is that Wars a of the guitar. Sound? Yeah, 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 yeah. What the heck is going on here? Um, and I'm just assuming, like, you just chop, you just recorded some stuff and, and sent it to the DJs, and did they just sometimes? Chop it and sometimes up? it was like sort of sending it back and forth. But throughout my career, I've, I've, you know, my stock and trade has been guitar sounds that don't necessarily sound like guitar. You know, right. and uh, and so and I've been influenced to practice stuff that DJs do to practice stuff. It was originally like Crystal Method and Prodigy. And they had these kind of crazy electronic sounds and textures. I said, well, what if I practice rather than practicing Chuck Berry riffs or Ingve Malmsteen riffs? What if I practice Prodigy riffs? And and while I wasn't able to play exactly what they were playing, that practicing put me in an entirely different headspace to create something that was very unusual in my own voice on the guitar. So sort of melding those two, like I said, this is really like a cyborg record where you don't necessarily know where the guitar ends and where the uh, electro digital noises begin. I like that. Well, I'll tell you one of my favorite moments is 
like in lead poisoning, mm -hmm. right after they say lead poisoning and they yeah. go into that really craziness. Yeah, yeah. craziness. Do you remember how that was produced? Sure, sure, sure. Well, that's the song with uh, Arisa and Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, and, uh, he, and Hero Bust is the, uh, is the producer of that record. But I had that, there's a, this big, you know, I, I'm, a, um, I'm a riff hoarder, so, so I have this kind of endless bank of big-ass riffs, that I, you know, like looking for homes, uh, and, and I married that to, 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 you know, to that beat and just thought that that's one of the heaviest riffs that you know, I've come up with, and we found a nice home for it. Yeah, um, what is, uh, if you had to pick a couple of things out on the record that made you smile, you know, sure. that, that, that you, you played yourself? Like, yeah, where, yeah, where well, I mean, you... the, the, the opening track, Battle Sirens, with Knife Parties, like that opening riff there, like, would feel very, very comfortable on Black Sabbath Volume 4, you know, and it's really like sort of a mission statement. It's like, you know, the, the, the tune then does take this crazy, crazy left turn, but it's like the first music you hear on the entire record is My Roots, which is like 70s huge unapologetic riff rock, so I really love that one. Um, there's another song called Roadrunner, which is one of the most like uh, uh, crazy and explosive and unusual riffs, which I just like dare guitar players to figure out how that's played, because <laughs> it's, it's like it's a really crazy, like it was one of those things where it happened one time and I'm glad we recorded it, you know? Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, recreating that live has been a challenge. I, I think uh, Roadrunner is probably like the heaviest, grungiest, yeah. Song I've heard all year. It's yeah, it, yeah. it it's killer. It gets out there, man. Yeah. Um, so was there somebody that took something that you sent them and then spun it around in some sort of interesting way, and you would have like sure. I would have never thought of sure. Well, it pre pre that pretty context. lights. I spent a couple of days down at his uh, Derek is his name down in in New Orleans. And first of all, I would say I thought that Be Real smoked a lot of weed, and. <laughs> I spent two days in Dude's studio, and I still, this is like a year and a half ago, and I still have secondhand <laughs> contact <high. laughs> so like, my gosh. So, so we recorded it, what felt like, an, I have no idea how much music it was. It may, we may still be recording it now. It's hard to know. Uh, this, kind of, <laughs> this sort of endless, you know, sort of loops and jams and guys crawling on the floor with effects pedals doing this and that and the other. Um, and it was a sprawling thing that I was like, well, what is this going to be? Because it really felt like this kind of sort of hippie, electronic, you know, guitar freakout jam. And it, and, it, and it molded itself into a, a song called One Nation, which is like a tight three and a half minute. Re one of the songs really sort of distills the heart of the record that has like the best of what I play as a guitar player and the best of what he does as a producer. Um, well, one person that you know, is sort of missing from this, this, this record is um, the, the late uh, Chris Cornell. And uh, I was sort of wondering if you've been able to process that loss and, and sort of... Short answer, no. It's, it's brutal, dude. Like, it's, uh, he was a good friend, a great artist. I never stopped being a fan of his, but the hole that he left is one that will never be filled. And uh, I was glad that we were able to do the uh, um, concert, in his, the memorial concert. That felt like, like everybody in the world who was a Chris Cornell fan knew that that was happening on that night. And for five hours, um, um, friends of his, bandmates of his, artists who his children loved, you know, all got together to, to pay respects to his incredible catalog and self. But it's, uh, that's, a, it's a, that's an unresolvable one there. That one's yeah. not going away. I, I, in all of my, every one of my shows, I, there's a couple of moments that we, you know, devote to him. So I like to, I still like to hear his voice in the room. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting because the, there's a lot of statistics out there that something like 60% of musicians wrestle with depression or forms of anxiety. And um, it feels like that that should be talked about a yeah. little bit more. That's, that's a subject that's been yeah. sort of swept under the carpet. And well, I think that you know, the creative gene and the, and the mentally not entirely okay gene are related genes, you know? And you yeah. maybe throw in the addictive gene as well. And it's not, it's not a surprise that some of the people who are the most uh, talented and creative wrestle with demons. And the, you know, the, the, that's the bad news. The good news is that in Chris's case, he was able to harness those demons for uh, an incredible career, make some of the greatest rock and roll and greatest singing that's ever you know, been put down on tape. So we have that as a legacy that we don't have him anymore. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, living the creative life and, uh, you know, you've been successful for a very long time, but I sh I'm sure you remember uh, when you were uh, coming up and you're wondering, am I going to be a success? Am I going to, you know, am I going to succeed? Am I going to be able to be a creative person and yeah. make it through that world? I mean, that's also just a tough thing that artists always have to wrestle with. Sure. I mean, and, and occasionally when people ask, like, like, how do you become successful? Um, I think that there might have been a different answer when I moved to Hollywood in 1986, and it had to do with having the right A&R person coming to a show. I would say now there's only one answer to that question, is you are a success if you are playing music that you love and you're enjoying it, period. And if you're doing that in your basement by yourself, or if you're doing it in a stadium with 80,000 people, that should be the only bar for success. If you do that, you will be fulfilled as a musician, as an artist. If you chase the other stuff, you you know good luck you know and right. and you can sometimes allow your 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 vision and what it is that you love to be distracted by trying to become successful and all of a sudden you know now you're not who you were supposed to be as an artist whether or not you achieve that success and i know people who do play stadiums who are not psyched about what they're playing and what their you know artistic lives are and i know people who you know, jam ACDC songs in their bedrooms and love it and fucking love it. And it's worth, and it's so worth it to have learned those four chords. I do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, another person too is, would have fit right in on this record would be uh, Zach De La Rocca. Has that ship sailed or do you ever see Envision working with him again? I'm totally open to it, but there's no, there's no word on that front. Right, right. Uh, is there somebody that you didn't get, or somebody that you'd like to work with and and do a collab with that maybe yeah. maybe the next Atlas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, record, I, this yeah. this record is actually I, I always sort of intended it to be uh, two albums. So there's a sister record in the works uh, for this one. Some of the some really great collaborations had not yet come to fruition by the time we put this record out, and I've had some other ideas since. But I've been really you know blessed as a guitar player to play with Zach De La Rocha, Chris Cornell. Bruce Springsteen, Chuck D, Be Real, it's kind of like a, you know, for me, it's kind of a, a Mount Rushmore of awesome front men, singers, <laughs> and vocalists. Um, so really fortunate in that regard. But yeah, I love the idea of collab, but continuing, at least for one more record, I've got sort of a vision of, of these collaborations where I'm curating an album, but able to be very free and creative with different artists on each track. Um, I went to the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, mm. Uh, there's a great exhibit out there called Play It Loud, and uh, it, it catalogs uh, so many incredible guitars. And, you know, it's such a monument. And you have some guitars uh, in this thing. You it, tell it's, us it's the greatest gathering of musical instruments in the history of the world. I'm not, no kidding. It's inc I saw it yesterday. I saw it yesterday. And I've, you know, I've been to all the different museums of this, that, and the other. It is so, so stunning, you know, to be you know, in such close proximity to the guitar that Jimi Hendrix played at Woodstock. And then right there is the, is the Les Paul that Jimmy Page played on six of the Led Zeppelin records, which is right next to Eddie Van Halen's Frankenstein guitar and Eric Clapton's main guitar. And, it's, and then there's Chuck Berry's guitar that he invented rock and roll with. And it's all, it's really incredible. And I, you know, honored to, there's like four guys in the, sort of this middle section that talk about their art and guitar playing and it's Keith Richards and Eddie Van Halen and Jimmy Page and weirdly me <laughs> and, uh, which like I told my mom and she's like really I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I don't know why I'm psyched but I don't know why <laughs> so it's pretty crazy and very surreal moment you know I'm from very sort of humble guitar beginnings to like I just love the museum like leave my stuff out of it. I just love the museum so much and the I think it's up till October so check it out what was that phone call like? Well, at first I didn't, I gotta tell you, I really didn't understand the full magnitude of it till I saw, till I saw it yesterday. You know, they came to my house and they filmed me and they, we talked about my gear and I showed some techniques and they're like, yeah, we're gonna put this in a place and it's gonna be Jimmy Page and Eddie Van Halen and Keith Richards and you. And I'm like, that's fucking nuts, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like sort of imagining my, you know, 17 year old self, you know, with my K, $50 K guitar with the action about, you know, like a, foot and a half off the, uh, uh, just trying to imagine that that would be company that I would one day be in, at least, so it's really pretty awesome. 
What was, what ne was I never stopped being a fan. And it'd be like, it's just, it's so great. So go see it. You can look at my stuff or not, but check it out. It's really fantastic. What was the one guitar that really stopped you in your tracks? I couldn't, I mean, I'm still processing the whole thing. Like, I, I, each new room had something that was so mind blowing. Um, and, and, and the thing is, like, these are not, they're not like relics. They're, they're, they're divining rods that have brought, you know, have, you know, have created some of the sounds that have affected the world deeply and emotionally. And, you know, for me, I guess the, the, there's this, like, the, the, the Van Halen guitar and the Jimmy Page guitar and the, I don't know, and the Hendrix guitar. It's like, it's the, and they have Stevie's number one there. Thank you very much. That's another one, too. I took a picture of that. There, there are so Inst many guitars there. They Instagrammed <laughs> that today. Like, it's, fan it's, just in it's really incredible. Yeah. And, the, and, and there's, these are instruments that, that at one time lit the world on fire. And the crazy thing about rock and roll is, like, right now, somewhere, there are people playing instruments that will one day be looked at in the same way that we're looking at those um, living, breathing instruments that are out there right now. So that's pretty crazy that we live they, in that time. They may be... Uh, they may be software. They may be. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they could be all hard, kinds of different things. Say, um, so I'm tonight. I'm going to go and see your band play. Right on. I'm, I'm totally psyched about right that. Uh, I don't. I, I'm sorry to say I should know this. I should have researched it. But can you tell me what I'm going to go see? I can tell you, but I would like you to just. I mean, the thing about this, it is a Tom Morello solo show. What does that even mean? And uh, one of the things on on this tour, it's been. Uh, like we ma I made a record with 20 vocal collaborators and none of them are on tour and you won't miss the fact that none of them are on tour um, I collaborated with Sean Evans who was the artistic director for Roger Waters last two tours oh, wow. he did the wall and the us and them tour so we made this show together and it's um, it's unlike any show that I've ever put on it's sort of 42 percent crazy art political art installation and then the rest just guitar pyrotechnic throw down like I've never done before. And it's challenging for me, and it's been one of the, it's been the, maybe the most fun I've had in a, in a decades of like putting a show together and rocking it every night. I'm really proud of it, so come check it out. So I'm gonna ask you one more question, then we're gonna uh, ask some questions to the audience, get some questions from the audience, so guys, start thinking a little bit. <laughs> um, so what's, you're, you're, you're so prolific, and I, I find that awesome. And yeah. all, the, you know, all the projects are, are, are a little different from each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where, where are you pushing next? Sure, sure, sure. So we're, this Atlas Underground Live Tour will continue through 2020. Um, we'll have uh, hopefully new, some new Prophets of Rage music out in the not-too-distant future. We're touring Europe uh, with that. Um, and then continuing my ACLU ambassador duties and bringing... Uh, Furious rock and roll to the planet uh, <laughs> until they drag me away. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Can we? Uh, does anybody out there Open have a the question? Open the floor to questions. There's a gentleman uh, right we there. We got the mic here. Okay, we're gonna start right here. How are you, sir? It's a pleasure. I'm good. What's up, man? Listen, your favorite Hendrix song and why? But if I can just tell you mine, mine sure. is "Driving South" from the BBC Sessions. Oh, really? Yeah, Shit yeah. made me play guitar badly, <laughs> but it made me play guitar. Wow. So. Um, I'd maybe go with. I mean, just off the top of my head. I mean, the, the first one that I heard was "Purple Haze," and it just was like the mind blowing. But I'd say maybe my, my favorite one might be "Machine Gun" in a way that in a way that that Hendrix did a thing which I've attempted to do in some of my music, whereas you create like. Like, music without any lyrics can be political. And Hendrick's song, Machine Gun, recreates this, a soundscape of the Vietnam War through his Marshall amplifier in a way that is compelling a political statement as anything written by Bob Dylan. Yes, absolutely. That's true. That's true. Okay. Hey, how are you? I'm good, what's up? Uh, thank you for being you. You're, you're absolutely awesome. Um, my question I'm is... I'm stuck, but thank you. <laughs> I heard, uh, heard in a, an interview you did with, I think it was Radar Music, that you said there's a great amount of audio slave material in the vault. Yeah. yeah. Any, any chance that music's going to see the, the There certainly is a chance. There's no, there are no plans for that currently to be released, but there's no impediments to being released either. We'll figure it out at some point. But there's a, there's a lot of... There's, you know, probably a, a record's worth of stuff that uh, that didn't get released. It's really good too, because we some of the some of the the choices of what songs were on what records were almost arbitrary. And some of there's a few of my favorite Audio Slave songs that just never saw, fully saw the light of day. And so, hopefully, they'll come out at some point. Yeah, make it happen. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, we'll take this one right here. Thanks. Hi, thanks for uh, signing the stuff earlier. <laughs> you got it, man. So um, the one thing that really stands out with you playing with Bruce is Bowie brought stuff out of Robert Fripp that Robert Fripp wouldn't have played sure. if not for Bowie. Sure. And he did the same thing with Pete Townshend. And then Prince at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with George's. Uh, sure. So it was like five years when Bruce was making records before Rolling Stone started saying, you know, he's a really good guitarist. Mm, sure. And that's 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. He's a really good guitarist. So you're on stage with him. And back when you did the, uh, the album with this depression, mm -hmm. it's like you're taking him to some, some other place. And he's got Nils there. So how does that interplay work? I mean, uh, you watch some of the Tom Joad live stuff, and it's like he's pushing you, but then yeah. you're pushing back and taking him someplace he hasn't been before. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not a casual Bruce Springsteen fan, so the, the idea to ever get to play with the E Street Band was, it, it wasn't a dream come true, because it was something I never would have dared to dream. And uh, in 2008, it's the first time we played together, and we played The Ghost of Tom Joad, and uh, you know, Bruce had an, an acoustic version of that song on his record, and Rage Against the Machine had covered it with, with kind of like a heavy Sabbath-esque version of the song, and and the arrangement that he constructed that we played together is maybe somewhere, somewhere in the middle. But you're absolutely right. I mean, playing that song with him, um, one of the things uh, that, that pushed my playing in Rage Against the Machine was it was all all the music was like James Brown based. It all came down to the one. There are maybe in four Rage Against the Machine records there are zero chord progressions. Like each song just re relentlessly returns to one, like a lot of hip hop music does. Um, and so when there was this this kind of stirring minor key chord progression, which is the ghost of Tom Joad, it recontextualized my playing. A lot of the things, I, I, in that song, I play notes and some crazy tricks and stuff that, I, that were not new to my vocabulary, but they were recontextualized by playing them in an 82 bar solo, you know, with, with Bruce's incredible arrangement, that at the end of that first day, in first night in Anaheim we played together, we looked at each other like, holy shit, like what just, like the roof just came off. It's one of those instances of like, you know, one plus one equals 35 and a half and no one knows why it happened. Um, and so, you know, then having the good fortune to play on a couple of Bruce records and tour on and off of them for six years is really one of the highlights of my musical life. That dude is a and good... He is a, and he's a good guitar player. He is a good yeah, lead yeah. player. I mean, yeah. you, you almost wish that he had done more. I got to tell you, on the, on the, on the, I think on the record, Darkness on the Edge of Town, that's really, really great, you know, sort of emotional and melodic guitar playing. That's... Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was awesome, like to you know, to be able with, on the E Street Band with you know Nils and and Steven. Sometimes, sometimes it was all four of us, and to be able to sort of trade guitar solos and like it would, for me, it's an out of body. I cannot explain like what a Bruce Springsteen fan. You know, he's, I once long before meeting him, he was like, I think Patty was dropping off videos at Tower Video on Sunset, and he like pulled up in a convertible, and I had and my friend had to restrain me from kissing his head. You know, like. <laughs> I've never told him that story, but, it's <laughs> <laughs> but then you sort of cut to standing on stage and playing Born to Run. I'm like, what happens? How did that happen? Okay, we've got another question right here. Can I kiss your head? <laughs> if you see me dropping off a video at Tower, yes, you may, but only under that circumstance. That's reserved. Well, as, as a guitar player, I'm forever indebted to you, so thank you so much for creating a, a unique sound that all of us took to and inspired us, so thank you for that. Um, my question is around working for a senator, yeah. and if you have any other political aspirations ahead of you. <laughs> uh, well, I worked for two years as the scheduling secretary for United States Senator Alan Cranston. This was in the late 80s, and uh, it cured me of any desire to ever <laughs> work in electoral politics. And while Senator Cranston was a very, you know, uh, uh, progressive on in immigrant issues and the environment, the, the fact that the office was totally beholden to money, uh, to big money and wealthy dudes in Wall Street was something that was crystal clear. I got to see how the sausage is made and it's worse than you could possibly imagine. Um, and it really cured me of ever, like, they, like I'm, I believe that I'm involved in you know, kind of a, a sonic guerrilla politics every day and at every show with a missionary zeal that's something that I could never do in a, you know, it would be a much more compromised version of what I want to do if I was ever to sort of submit myself to that. Is it better process. or worse than Veep? Than what? Than Veep. Uh, it's, uh, 
I mean, it's 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 crazy. I mean, it's just it's all money, all yeah. money all the time. It's, Hey, I think we have to keep it on the mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. We'll talk about that. Yeah, you, I, I, he was. He was very big on it. He was big on it. And the price for it was, he, he, the, the, the prison said, like, Alan Krantz in the center who I work for was very big on prison reform, which is absolutely true. And the price for him having access to power to, put, to potentially help that was his soul and, and having to be entirely beholden to rich dudes. He eventually was, you know, his career ended with a thing called the Keating scandal, where, where he was caught sort of trading favors for a lot of money so it's like that if you want to do that that's a route but that's not my route let's take one more music related question sure. <laughs> humbuckers go how are you string gauge go first of all i love the shirt oh yeah yeah so, but, for those and, of you who know no it's a yeah. soccer team and, and uh my question would be you've worked with a lot of great musicians and a lot of great uh vocalists and with a lot of great rappers is there someone you haven't worked with that you would like to? And can I suggest one from New York on your next album? Is it you? Not me. I'm horrible. <laughs> it, it's a guy. I, I'm horrible, but the guy I'm going to suggest is not, and I think might be KRS-One. What do oh, you think I've, of a guy like KRS-One and I, some guys you haven't worked with? I've, I've collaborated with KRS-One, yeah. believe it or not. Like my yeah. first, uh, the first remix I ever did was... Oh, I uh, was in a way, I'm sorry. That's right, that's right. It's, it was long ago. I think it was sort of before the digital era. But yeah, there's, um, um, you know, I've had the, the great fortune to play in some uh, capacity with really almost every musician who I really wanted. Like, it's so crazy. Like, from, from Bruce Springsteen to Jimmy Page to Joe Strummer. Like, the records that just set me on fire as a, as a person. I've, you know, I've been... So it's like, it's, I, it's, it's a blessing beyond 25 blessings. So um, uh, there, there are... I'm always looking for new ways to challenge myself creatively. And so as I continue to do these collaborative process, you know, there's a couple of artists for the... You know, like I was really interested in working with Pussy Riot, and so I made a song with them for my next record. And you know, there's some other people too, but I've, you know, I got to stand on stage with Ozzy Osbourne and play Mr. Crowley. So I kind of like went, <laughs> boom, drop the mic. Like that was sort of my, for me, that was like the peak. Yeah. How about, I'm going to take another There's question. Yeah. Here you go. So I'm a huge Rage fan, and I've seen you from Rage, that was my first concert ever, awesome. to Audio Slave, all the way to The Night Watchman, right Prophets of Rage. Um, which band would you like to be most remembered for, and why? Um, I have, and I, I don't choose between them, and I think that each one was of, the thing they all have in common is they were all, and are, all completely authentic representations of who those people are when they were making those records and playing those shows. So um, I will say that, like, for me, the, 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 uh, it, when we began Rage Against the Machine, the idea of making a band with zero commercial aspirations was a very liberating thing. Like, we didn't think we would be able to book a club gig. There was, not, there was no hope of booking a club gig, let alone getting a record deal or you knowing about that band, right? Um, and so being able to make, create in, a, in an atmosphere which was entirely free from sort of worry of what anyone might think was very liberating. And let's say the second one was when you know, briefly, th then with Audio Slave, getting to play with one of my favorite vocalists of all time, Chris Cornell, and being challenged to create music that would highlight his incredible vocals. Then with the Night Watchman stuff, being able to be a singer. Like, if you want, here's, here, hey, guitar players out there. Hey, well, thank you, for, but, but if you're a guitar player, here's what you should do, is you should sing. Then you will never be beholden to the whims of a lead vocalist. <laughs> Otherwise, you got, you're a guy over in the corner playing solos, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so, but, just, but just to have the, the, I, the, how my inspiration for that was I was at a, uh, a teenage homeless shelter called Covenant House um, in, in, in Hollywood on Thanksgiving. They were having like sort of an open mic thing. And there was this kid who got up there and he didn't have a great voice and he had an out of tune guitar and he played two songs like the, like the, everyone's soul in the room was at stake. And you know, and here I am with my hits on the radio with Audio Slave touring the world. And I thought, I want some of that. Like, I want some of that. And so I started writing my own, at 30, what, years, six, seven years old, I started writing my own songs and singing in coffee houses. And when we would be on tour with Audio Slave playing arenas, on nights off, I would go to open mic nights and sing my song with, with the same dedication and passion as I ever had in any of my other outfits. And that to me was really like, it felt 
when you're an artist, you know when you're doing the right thing, and that really felt like I was doing the right thing, as with this Alice Underground record. I saw you with Boots Riley in Boston. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was for Boots Riley. He's asking if I've ever played Fuck the Police in concert several times in very dramatic circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Inappropriate circumstances. <laughs> well, I think on that note... <laughs> <laughs> no, humbucker, like thank... no humbucker. All right, that's fine. <laughs> EMGs, go. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to thank Tom for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. It's thank fantastic. you all for your thoughtful questioning. But I really want... Every guitarist out there, I really encourage you to listen to uh, the Atlas Underground and give it some, some thought because I think Tom's doing some really great ground-breaking uh, work on it. And uh, thank you again. Thanks very much for having me. Have a okay. great day. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.